this morning, we are still talking about the Holy Spirit, week two. Uh, and I'm excited uh, to bring the word for you. Um, tonight, though, follows this morning up, and we're actually doing a panel tonight. Uh, we're going to answer some commonly asked questions about the Holy Spirit and give you a chance to uh, anonymous, anonymously ask some questions if you need to as well. So I encourage you, whether you've been in the faith forever or, or new to it, come tonight. It's going to be an awesome time as we learn and grow together. But one more thing. I just want to show you a picture of my son quick. Um, he puked on himself. And so this is my sermon before the sermon for somebody. If life pukes on your face, you can still smile through it. So whether it's puke, poop, or whatever's going on, this kid is always smiling and laughing and giggling. And uh, yeah, just crazy, repping the Vikings in that. So he's almost, uh, well, four, about four and a half months now, which is crazy. Little Judah is growing, getting huge puking on itself, so it's fun. It's awesome. All you parents, you know exactly what that picture is. <laughs> so this morning, though, man, I'm excited to share what God has placed on my heart, and we are talking this morning about how the Holy Spirit helps us, the evidence in our lives of how he helps us in every day and how that looks. But I want to set the stage quick before that. So we're going to go, let me just broad stroke it. God wanted to bring his creation back into relationship with him. Our sin separated us from, from Adam and Eve, and it separated us from God. And it was in his plan to send his son to die and to take our place for that sin. He was a perfect and sinless sacrifice, and he really was the only sacrifice that could get us into salvation, into right standing and relationship with God. And then... Once we accept that salvation, we get to have God's spirit in us. He's not at an arm's length away anymore, but we get to have an intimate relationship where he dwells in us. We are called the temple of his spirit. And, and that happened through Jesus dying. And so salvation needed to happen in order to get relationship. But that was only phase one of God's amazing plan. That was only phase one. There's a second phase to that, a second part to it. And here's, and here's why. Because salvation alone doesn't give us everything we need to live in spiritual victory and live in full abundant life. That sounds like heresy, but I promise you it's not. Here's why. Here's why. Because the next step was after Jesus died and rose again and he gave us relationship with God, but he left earth, he left us, and he said, there is someone and something better for you. And if I don't go, he won't come. So I need to get out of here and I'm going to send you somebody better for your life. He knew, Jesus knew we needed more in this life. We needed someone who was closer, who could accomplish more in us and through us in a more intimate way. And, and, and this phase two was Jesus sending his Holy Spirit. It was foretold way back in the Old Testament. It was prophesied God is going to pour out his spirit on all people. So God's end goal wasn't salvation and relationship. God's phase two of his plan, his end goal was to give us himself in the intimate form of his spirit that can live in us. Make sense? That was his end goal. And that's what, in John 16, it says, but now I'm going away, this is Jesus talking, to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because what I told you. But in fact, it is best, turn your neighbor, say best. It is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. Jesus himself said there is somebody better. There is a better plan. The completion of God's full plan and fullness of intimacy in relationship with you. There's someone better. See, I love the, the sentiment that Jesus lives in my heart. Jesus lives in my heart. I get that. But realistically, Jesus isn't in my heart. He's sitting on the right hand of God our Father, and he is interceding for us to God the Father. It's not in my heart. Who is in my heart? The Holy Spirit is in my heart. Now, yes, I understand the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is Jesus, who is God. That's a full another sermon and a half. I get that. But 
think about that. So our focus needs to be on this Holy Spirit in our hearts. And that's what's best for us. 2 Corinthians, thir- or 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18 says, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Turn it over say freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed so we can see and reflect the glory of God, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. See, the Holy Spirit is better for us. He has come to complete what God started, what Jesus purchased for us, the Holy Spirit that came and to make that happen and to give us the spiritual victory and to set us free and to make us more and more and more like Jesus in the sanctification process. And so salvation gives us the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit in us, which means salvation gives us the opportunity for freedom and to be constantly changed into the image of God. What do I mean by all this to set the stage for how the Holy Spirit helps us? Salvation isn't the finish line. Salvation is the starting line. It is the beginning of God, what God wants to do in your life. It is the opening of the door that God said, I made a way, now you can have my spirit in you. Make sense? Now my life doesn't just like, all right, sweet, in this life I found God and I have salvation, great, I'm good, we'll just end there. No, that's just the beginning of God, what God wants to do in your life and what he has planned for you to do is so much more, more power, more victory, more abundant life through his Holy Spirit. Amen? And that's what he has for us today. And that's what we're gonna be talking about. Man, if you can't tell, I'm fired up about this. And it's not because the coffee, because I, like, I think coffee tastes like burnt dirt. It's in the Bible somewhere, I'm sure. But. Here's the, the reality, though, that I, in my own life, have lived and I see sometimes today, is that Christians have stopped after phase one. I've got there, I got salvation, I'm good to go, I'm just gonna do me and live, and I'm not saying they're just throwing themselves in sin and just you know banking on the fact that God saved, no, I'm saying like, there's no power in their life. There's no evidence of the Holy Spirit doing what they cannot do. There's no fruit of the, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I want us this morning to not just use salvation as a finish line, but truly the starting line to what God has when Jesus says, I have come to give you abundant life. Abundant life, that comes through the Holy Spirit. Because there's a big difference in being, in living, trying not to sin, and living, walking in victory. There's a big difference in that, and how I walk, and how how the Holy Spirit works in me. Because here's the deal about the Holy Spirit. When he's in your life, he gives you the advantage. He is our advantage in every situation. Think about this. Everywhere I go, it said the Holy Spirit's in me and never leaves me, right? And I have access to him. He's my helper. He's my advocate. And I have a relationship with him. So no matter what temptation, no matter what struggle, no matter what what schemes of hell are trying to come against me, no matter how difficult of a situation, hopeless, no matter how terrifying, or no matter how impossible a situation may be in front of me, I still have the advantage. I have the advantage going into that. And I can have a confidence that who is with me is more powerful than anything up against me. And not that he's just with me, but he wants me to thrive in this life. He wants me to walk in freedom and in victory. That's who the Holy Spirit is to me. And it's not because of me. It's because who is, uh, because of the one who is with me. When you start realizing who lives inside of you, it will change how you live. It will change how you live. It will change how you see obstacles. It will change how you see opportunities. It will change you to know I have the advantage everywhere I go. I have the upper hand. I have, I have checkmate, you know what I'm saying? Like I have victory. Romans eight, one through two. So, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Man, I could just end there. 
that Holy Spirit frees us, is our freedom from the power of sin in our lives. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus, jumping down to verse 11, sorry. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. And for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Holy Spirit has now given us, when we ex accept that salvation and, and God gives us his spirit to live on us, we now have the option to sin. We have the choice now to say, you know what? I'm being pulled in that way. My natural state as a sinful nature is pulling me that way. But now by the spirit, I don't have to choose it. I'm not just some kind of animal level where I'm just following my desires and following my feelings before God giving me the Holy Spirit. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's where freedom comes from. See, the Holy Spirit puts to death our old lives and the power of sin. He puts them to death and we need him every single day. It's not, the Holy Spirit isn't just for the super spiritual or the super Christian or the super committed. He's not, he's for every Christian, every single one. See, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not a luxury, it's a necessity. It is a necessity and we are truly powerless without him. If you want to walk from my old life into the new, it only happens by the Holy Spirit. It only happens through him. And so I just wanna highlight, laying that foundation of who the Holy Spirit is with us, three ways that he gives us the advantage in life. Three evidences of who he is and how he helps us every single day. So the first one is the spirit of truth. Turn to your neighbor, say truth. I'm gonna read a couple verses here. John 15, 26. But I will send you the advocate who is the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak from, uh, on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. And then finally, John 14, 16 through 17, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. This word, the advocate that we see coming up, it, it, the Greek word for that is paraclete. And this can be translated into comforter, encourager, helper, or counselor. That Greek word in context would be used to describe a legal counselor. Someone to give you legal counsel, show you the right way, tell you the right thing, and guide you to the right way. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. When he comforts or encourages us, he's giving us truth about our situations. When he helps us or, or gives us wisdom or right counsel, he's leading us to the truth in the right way. See, the Holy Spirit is always leading us towards truth and away from lies. That's what he's doing. Satan, on the other hand, his main and most powerful tactic to bring us down is the opposite. He's always leading us into the lie and leading us away from truth. He uses lies, he uses what is false, what is fake, he uses deception, and he gives us counterfeit. And that's how he tries to destroy us and bring us down. See, Satan will speak to your mind and he'll lie about who you are, He'll lie about God and his word. He'll lie about what's around you. He'll lie about your future. He'll lie about your past. He'll lie about anything he can to bind you in lies. And the Holy Spirit is the opposite. The Holy Spirit has come to lead us to the truth about us. He breaks down those lies. He brings those lies into the light and shows them to be false. Satan's lies, they shackle us. They bind us. But the Holy Spirit's truth sets us free from those things. That's why in scripture we see it said this, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
That's why I have freedom through the Holy Spirit. In John 8, it also references Jesus as saying, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you see that, that correlation there that Satan, when he lies to you, every, every struggle, every fear, every addiction, every sin that we have in our lives is the byproduct of believing a lie. You can break it down, uncover the layers, you believed a lie at some point and then you acted on it. And that, that, that makes us shackled to sin and binds us up. But that's why God sent us the greatest weapon we have against Satan is the Holy Spirit leading us to truth. So Satan's telling me something about my past and the Holy Spirit is bringing me saying, uh-uh, look what Jesus did for you, look what he has for you, he has a plan, you know what I'm saying? And, and that destroys what Satan's doing. Jesus gave us, by going away and dying, Jesus gave us the greatest weapon against Satan's greatest weapon. And if we do not live in communion and live with the Holy Spirit daily, what, what shackles are we ha- what do we have on us that God has given us the truth to destroy, that we're not focusing on? In John 14, it says, when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. The Holy Spirit teaches us even more in these deeper truths, these mysteries of God. And he reminds us of the truth when we need it. He brings it back to our attention to go, hey, you're in this. This is what you need. This is the truth about it. If I'm about to sin or I'm dwelling in a certain lie or this is going on or I'm facing an obstacle, he reminds me the truth about that. But here's the thing. Holy Spirit can't teach me or remind me if I'm not reading the truth that is God's word. He cannot remind me of something that I do not know. He can't. He won't expound and teach me deeper things if I'm not in the word of God. That's why the Sunday school answer to living in freedom, the, where the truth is, is reading your Bible. The Holy Spirit uses that and reminds me. And so the more that you're reading scripture, the more that you're digesting it, I think of King David says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Because that word comes to life through the Holy Spirit right when I need it and it helps me to live victorious in this life and it sets me free. You see the correlation there? So if I'm not in the word of God, how is the Holy Spirit gonna lead me to truth? We need to be in the word of God. We need to be people of the word. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't just lead us to truth. Like I said, he leads us away from lies. John 16, verse eight. And when, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and all of the coming judgment. He convicts the world. He convicts us. He shows us where we're wrong and what is wrong and what we shouldn't do. And you may be saying, well, I know that. I've felt that before. I felt that tug and that pressure of I know I'm, I'm about to do something or I'm nervous, like that is the Holy Spirit speaking to me, telling me not to do that or not believe that or not be there or not, or I am wrong, this is where I'm wrong, this is what I messed up there. And I would challenge us, man, if, if the Holy Spirit is, has our best intentions leading us to the truth that sets us free, Why would I not follow that every single time? Why, why would I not follow that? Why would I continually put myself into bondage? When you feel the Holy Spirit speaking, let me challenge you with this. It is not a suggestion, it is a command. The word of God is not a suggestion, it is a command. And so many times we treat it as suggestion. Not just the negative, but the positive. Oh, Holy Spirit telling me to stay away from that? Uh, I kind of picture it as angel and, and a demon or a devil on one side and angel on the other and it's kind of this conversation and who presents the best argument I'm gonna choose. No, 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 it's not an option. When Holy Spirit is speaking, I need to follow. I have to. I absolutely have to follow it. It is a command to me. And even when you're out and about and, and Holy Spirit's tugging at you, hey, pay for that person behind you. Hey, go ask them if they need prayer. Hey, do, go out of your way for this. Do that. That's not a suggestion. And side note, this is free. This is in my notes. I, <laughs> I find so many 
people sometimes, the Holy Spirit speaks something to them about somebody else, about going and helping or doing this, and instead of, yes, Lord, I'll do it, whatever you need, instead I get responses like, ah, I just feel like I need to pray about that a little more. So you tell me I need to pray about what the Holy Spirit is commanding me to do? Doesn't make sense. Just do it. Let's just do it. Can we just do that? That's free. That's free. Just like the puke thing, that was free too. So spirit of truth, the second one is fruits of the spirit. Fruits of the spirit, Galatians 5, 20 through to, 22 through 25. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. We follow him. Holy Spirit adds so much into my life. Think of all these fruits that I can have access to every day, all the time. Love, peace, patience. Lord, help me with some patience. Faithfulness, self-control. These are things that are, I need. I need these things every day. And they give me the advantage in situations. And I always thought when I heard these taught, and I remember you know, memorizing them in and, and Sunday school, and I always thought this was just like a moral standard. Like, I should be patient. Yeah, 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 I'm a Christian. I should be patient. I should be this. I should have love. And I, it was almost a goal for me. This is, this is what I want to get my life to. And I constantly found myself lacking patience and then going, ah, I don't have it. Lacking self-control. But let me encourage you this morning, the fruits of the Spirit are not goals. They are gifts. They are gifts for us through the Holy Spirit in our lives. They are gifted to us. We cannot produce these or achieve these things on our own. Our sinful nature, these are not natural things for our sinful nature. You understand that? It's not natural for our sinful nature to be patient with one another, to have peace, to be loving no matter what. So the Holy Spirit produces them as I follow him. I don't have to reach for them, I just get to receive them. I don't have to achieve them, I just get to accept them. I think it's a beautiful picture as these fruits are often referred as the graces of the Holy Spirit. The graces of the Holy Spirit. That, that there's something that I can't earn that is a gift from him. By his grace, he's given me some love in this season. He's given me some peace in this season. He's given me a, a spirit of faithfulness in this season. They're not goals, they're gifts. And I get them not by working for the Holy Spirit, by walking with the Holy Spirit. Think about fruit. Fruit is not manufactured, it's grown. It comes from life, not from a factory. It is grown, it is grown. And so fruit in my life doesn't come as a byproduct of my work. It's not something I can manufacture, but it truly is grown and produced by a life-giving, as we just read, relationship with the Holy Spirit. So if you need any of those things in your life, Holy Spirit will grace you with that. He will grace you with what you do not have in the season that you need it in. Truth, fruit, Last one is the Holy Spirit's power. Turn your neighbor and say power. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Greek word here for power is dunamis. Dunamis. It's defined as being able to produce a strong effect, power, might, and strength as a spiritual manifestation like miracles, wonders, powerful deeds. This word is used 10 times just right after this is said, talking about how the apostles are living, the acts of the apostles. They're talking about they lived in dunamis because they lived in the spirit. For us and the believers, it's the power to achieve by applying the Lord's abilities to our lives. The power through God's ability. 
Dunamis is mentioned 120 times in the New Testament. It's not just something that's rare. And it's not just something that's random. It should follow us. We get dunamis. We get power when we live and walk in the Holy Spirit. Power to do things that we can't accomplish. By his strength and his ability alone. See, so many times we think of Holy Spirit as just like an adrenaline shot from every time and time again. Like he's just like, he's a, he's a power. He's a force that I just fill up with every once in a while. That's not true. Holy Spirit isn't a power, he's a person. He's a person, and that power comes from association. It comes from being with him and walking with him daily. If I recognize him in my life as I walk, I have access to this power, this dunamis. He's not simply a divine influence, he's a divine person. And this verse doesn't say when power comes upon you, it says when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power power. It's just a byproduct of living by the Spirit. This is a normal thing for Christians. It's a normal thing. Yes, miracles, wonders, the deeds of God, these supernatural things, it's maybe, it, it, it may not be natural, but it's normal. Or at least it should be for the Holy Spirit in our lives. But here's the thing with dunamis power. It's not for me. That power always has to do with people. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to what? To be a witness. To witness so that people may witness God in me. And witness God and bring glory to God. It always leads, this power always leads to being a good witness. If there's a healing, if there's a a prophetic word, if there's this and that, it always leads to being a good witness, to glorifying God through other people. It's not for me, but for others. And I think sometimes we get this twisted, that yes, I want that power, I wanna walk in that power, I wanna see miracles happen. But instead of me wanting to see miracles happen to be a witness, I want to see miracles happen so people can watch me. So all eyes turn to me instead of Jesus. That's not what the power is for, it's always to bring glory to God and to witness to other people. Look at this power displayed in the life of Peter. You see him rash and brash and and, and emotional and following his impulses and his feelings. The roller coaster. Jesus has got arrested and he runs away and then gets confronted by a little girl and he cowers in fear. He can't even admit that he was associated with Jesus. A little girl. We pick up in the same city, the same location, the same people. 53 days later, after the Holy Spirit came, Jesus died and rose again, he sent his spirit, upper room happened, and we see the same Peter Like I said, to the same people that he was cowering in fear of, he gets up with a boldness and fire and preaches, and it's not just like a feel good. He's saying, you killed my savior. Talk about some boldness. Do you think Peter just had a a master class in leadership development or worked on his public speaking or just got in the mirror for a little bit and just razzed himself up? No, that power didn't come from him. It came from the Holy Spirit in him. And we have access to that and it changes us. It changes how we live. And ordinary people in the the Bible, and even today we're able and are able to do extraordinary things because the Spirit of God, not by us, but by him. I don't believe there should be such thing as a powerful and a powerless Christian. Like, oh, they're just super spiritual and they walk in that and oh, I'm good, like, I'm saved. I don't think there should be a difference. If you are a Christian, you have access to dunamis power through the Holy Spirit in your life. It just depends on if you're walking in it. As Christians, we are full of the power that the Holy Spirit brings. But it's a sad thing to me that there's so many powerless Christians. (laughs) Sounds like an oxymoron to me. There's so many people living without power. And what does our world need more than ever right now? 
a powerful church, a powerful church that leads people to him, that shows that Jesus rose from the dead, that he is alive and that the spirit of God is alive in us. The Holy Spirit wants to do something amazing in you. Pastor Brett, would you come? The Holy Spirit wants to do something amazing in your workplace, at your school, in your car, on your commute, when you're, when you're babysitting, when you're watching kids, in this church, everywhere, because the Holy Spirit is in us. He gives us the advantage in every situation. Can you imagine what our community would look like, what our country would look like, what our world would look like if every Christian started actually following the Holy Spirit every single day? Can you imagine the power, the fruit of the Spirit produced, the truth that we would be walking in, the freedom? Can you imagine? See, when you're walking with the Holy Spirit, the evidence is all around you, or at least it should be. The evidence is in you. And Jesus, through salvation, got our lives to heaven. But the Holy Spirit brings heaven into our lives now. He's that abundant life, that advantage that we have. And I just wanna give you a moment. I'm not gonna invite the rest of the worship team and Pastor Brett's not even gonna sing. I just needed some Jesus keys some spirit keys but the reality is when you leave this church you're not going to have a amazing pastor brett led worship team following you around you're not going to have a speaker following you around but you will have the holy spirit and that's all you need that's all you need and so i want to give us an opportunity in this service to be obedient to the holy spirit whatever he's leading i believe he may tell you to go pray for someone he may be speaking some truth for you you may want to come down for a need. You need healing. Holy Spirit can do it. Not me, but he can. Maybe you're feeling called and tugged to pray for someone in this room or, what, or speak a word. I'll tell you what, after our weekend retreat, our, our students have been challenged and challenged just to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit's doing. And the atmosphere that it's creating in our group is amazing. We have these sixth graders that feel a tug on the spirit that are going to pray for seniors saying, I feel like God spoke to me this over your life and it's spot on. Just because they're being obedient. I believe we're about to see some miracles happen in our group. Just because a student's saying, oh, I feel like God's telling me to pray for someone. Do you have a need? Let me just pray for you. The Holy Spirit can do something. That's it. There's no pressure in this place. But I want to set the table now because if we can't follow the Holy Spirit now, we're not going to do it out there. And I don't want to create some experience. I just want to create an encounter because you're meeting with a person this morning. So I'm just going to pray. Would you stand up all across this place and close your eyes, bow your head? I just want to give you a minute. Just a minute. If you're in this place and you would say, man, I haven't even walked to the door, Pastor Luke. I don't even have the spirit in me yet. I haven't accepted salvation. And I want that this morning. With every head bowed and eye closed, would, if that's you and, and, and I just want to pray for you, would you just raise your hand and, and, and make eye contact with me so I can pray for you and you would accept Jesus and salvation would come, Holy Spirit would come in your life. Holy Spirit, thankful for you. For the rest of us, all right, that's good. Everyone has the Holy Spirit this morning. I'm just going to open the altars. I'm going to open this room. You may just feel like, man, I, 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 I need some truth in my life. I need this. I need to. But if he's calling you to be obedient in some way and go talk to someone or pray for someone, or if you need a filling of the Spirit, we want to pray for you. And so, Holy Spirit, we, we give you the stage. We give you the room. We give you our attention, and we give you our hearts and our obedience. Whatever you want this morning, as we just take a couple minutes that will model our everyday lives of just giving you attention and giving you focus. Whatever you want to do in this place right now, it's nothing weird, we're just meeting with you. We thank you for all these advantages, all these evidences that you give us of how you help us. Would you help us right now? In your mighty name, amen. Thank you God that you sent your son to be in a relationship with you and be saved from our sins. But thank you, God, that you didn't leave us hanging to just 
wander and struggle and survive in this life. But you sent your advocate, your very spirit that changes everything for us. We can depend on you for everything. I pray for just such a, an awareness amongst our church and this family as we're walking through life. I pray for such awareness of your spirit speaking and moving and leading. Would you just use us, God? Holy Spirit, use us. Be so loud in our lives as we walk with you. Let this just be a set the stage, set the foundation of what we're going to do with you every day. Thank you for the power that you give us to accomplish things that we could never accomplish for your glory. So use us this week, this month. I don't want this God just to be a phase or a season for us, but truly, would we shift our relationship to focusing on you? We thank you for what you have in store. In your mighty, mighty name, we praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm believing in faith. You guys are about to see some crazy stuff happen. Not for the sake of crazy or amazing things, but obedience and what God's calling us to do. That we would make, be a good witness for him and that people would be set free. Amen? Amen. We love you. Come back tonight for part two of this. We'll see you next week.